every year on Lindau Island in Germany, dozens of Nobel laureates come to meet with hundreds of young scientists. It's rare for so many laureates to gather like this. So I'm taking the opportunity to ask some big questions about the state of medicine today. To try to get a picture of health. I suffer from hay fever, but if I take these, it makes me drowsy. Drowsiness is unpleasant, but other side effects can be much more dangerous. The question is, could we ever develop drugs that have no side effects? No. I would hope that we can. I don't think that drugs have side effects. In the last century, there have been incredible advances in drug development. From the ordinary aspirin, to cutting-edge combination therapies transforming HIV treatment, human health is ruled by pharmaceuticals. But almost every drug has a fundamental limitation. Whilst treating the core problem, they also produce side effects that can harm the body in surprising ways, sometimes fatally. But maybe all this could change. I met up with some young researchers who one day may affect side effects. So can we ever develop drugs that don't have any side effects? I would hope that at some point in the future we can move to a point where we can create drugs that have minimized side effects. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll ever be able to make drugs that are completely side effect free, but I would hope that we can. What are the challenges in creating drugs without side effects? Well, one of the first challenges is that um, people are different, so different side effects will uh, be found in different people, and that may be related to the genetic makeup of these people. Each person metabolizes drugs differently, and the same drug can have massively different effects. These vary all over the world and are controlled by genes. So one approach to reducing side effects is to understand this genetic variation better. So has the work of Oliver Smithies influenced the work that you're doing? Definitely, because he has been doing a lot of work in genetics and uh, completely changing the field. And so that's really important for us uh, when we are exploring variability in genetics. Oliver Smithies won his Nobel Prize in 2007 for a way of altering animal genomes, a technique crucial to genetic research. With his wealth of experience, does he think we'll ever get rid of side effects? What do you think? I think the answer is no. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. Because the, the more wide acting the drug is, the less specific it is, because it affects so many systems. And as you narrow a drug's application down, it, its actions are more restricted. But then it's often fooled by biology, you might say, because very frequently there's a related gene which will start to turn on when the other one turns off. It's very complicated. Yeah, because, because of biology, in a sense, or evolution, has selected so that, we, that we're relatively insensitive to changes in things because something else will make up for it. Oliver Smithies shared his prize with Martin Evans, who's particularly known for his work with mice. He was also at Lindau, and he looked at the problem in a very different way. I don't think that drugs have side effects. OK. I think drugs actually have effects. And, you know, the, the developers, the pharmaceutical companies, and indeed the, the uh, clinicians, are going to be concentrating on whether this drug can have a suitable effect. And then they try and ignore all the other effects and say those are side effects. Side effect is our interpretation of what we didn't want to happen. A bit like weeds in the garden, they're exactly. just plants in unwanted places. Exactly, yes. Actually, drugs, very largely, are selective poisons. Even if they only poison the function of one enzyme, say, that is likely to have multiple effects. And we know that from 
all these studies that have been so frustrating of knocking out genes in mice. There what we're doing is taking away one specific function. It's almost as though you had a perfect drug that kills one enzyme. And we think, oh, this will you know, have a, a very clear effect. Sometimes it does, but the real, in most cases, there are lots of effects. Supposing we say there are 10 genes that matter, and that the, each of these genes has a certain amount of variation in different individuals, then there's an enormous combination of these tens. It's difficult to sort it out. But in the mouse, you see, you can control it because you control the background. So no other genes are varying. Whereas in a human situation, other genes are varying. So uh, there's a very good example of this that you know, people have studied in large population and looking at people with high blood pressure and finding out what genetic regions are associated with an increase in blood pressure. The results are quite surprising that genes which you can show in the mouse have a, a very marked effect on blood pressure are not detected by these studies in humans. And it turns out that in, in a human study, because of the, say, between this gene and blood pressure, there are four or five intermediate steps. That in the, in the human, when, when this gene varies, there's so much noise of variation here that you don't see the effect there. But now you take a mouse, where all the genes are constants except the one you're uh, interested in, and you alter this gene, and then, because these are constant, you can see the effect here. And that's where some of your work comes in. You look at trying to predict what those differences might be, what those side effects, right. off-target effects sure, exactly. might be. So tell us a little bit about how you do that. So one of the things that uh, came out recently, which is very exciting, is the ability to make different types of uh, pluripotent stem cells from various people. And one of the advantages of this is, for example, if we want to make embryonic-like stem cells from your material, we can do that. We simply take your skin cell, grow those embryonic -like cells, and then make them into all different types of tissue. And then what we can then do is come in and start testing drugs against all those different tissues. So one of the most exciting technologies right now is the fact that you can take different tissues that are made from these stem cells I mentioned, and we can actually uh, start to build different kind of organs on a chip. And then we can connect these organs on a chip and say, all right, if we put in a drug in lung tissue, how will it then move and then be affected in the liver? So we're starting to look at these populations within the body as well. So you're building a miniature lung mm -hmm. and a miniature liver mm -hmm. and looking at how medication for one is affecting the other. Right. Is that one of the students that I met this week has been designing organ models on a chip so yes. there's blood flow and air yes. flow and they can look at how the drugs react and link up the different organs. Yes, I mean these sort of approaches are fantastic and, and will help but I don't think there is a silver bullet. Everything has to be taken as it happens and with a risk-benefit analysis. Is that the answer? If this works, is that the answer? Uh, if this works, that's one of the answers. Eventually, if we get to this kind of technology, we will be able to test personally everybody. However, um, it's, it's a bit of um, science fiction <laughs> right now. Uh, is it a better approach to say, well, we'll have your genomic information, your genetic information for some of these genes, and we'll know in advance, because we tested it in some populations, uh, that in fact this work will work for you, you won't have side effects when you take this drug. So it's not that we can create drugs which have no side effects, but we can start to choose who's most suited to which bunch of side effects, if you like. Exactly. Find out which individuals have the side effects, find the genes or genes uh, that are different in these individuals, and then say now, okay, we know that this person here will have side effects and this person over here won't. So you screen for that particular thing. And once you know the factor, you can design a relatively inexpensive test to say, well, don't use this drug in this person. It's not suitable. Very good over here. It's so fascinating to me, this work of building cells in the lab and modelling systems. But as a psychologist, it, it really strikes me that the way we experience drugs, our reactions to the drugs, it, it can't really be modelled by building a liver and a kidney. And... No, there are many aspects of 
biology which can't be modelled in a dish. Um, and psychology is a very good example. Uh, probably I would say that some of these can be modelled in suitable model organisms and of course a lot of that work's going on, particularly in neurological function. Um, One of those model organisms would presumably be in mice. In mice, yes. I'm noticing the mice on your tie. Oh well these, these are my golden mice. My work depended on some really nice mice who actually did the work and transmitted the genome. So if it wasn't for the mice I wouldn't be here. Martin Evans said there are no side effects, but there are, of course, unwanted effects. People do sometimes have bad reactions to drugs. We might not be able to totally get rid of those, but innovations like organ on a chip and delving into our genome should help us to minimise them. We're here in Lindau with 37 Nobel Prize winning scientists, 600 young researchers, 12 of them sponsored by Mars, and people want to hear all about the science that Mars has been doing. Well, the great thing about coming to Lindau is that we get to spend time with science's rock stars. You're aware that you're in the presence of greatness. And the more that we can find ways of engaging some of the finest minds in the world to helping us solve some of these grand challenges, I mean, there's got to be some great stuff in there. One of the things we do is we like to have a lunch where we basically spend time with the young scientists that we've sponsored to come here and tell them a little bit about the kind of company that we are, the kind of work that we do and why we passionately believe that these great scientists should consider coming to a company like Mars for a lifetime career in fun science that will make the world a better place. The best part really is that you get to actually meet these young scientists who will look at you in the eye and say, this is the best week of my life. You just sit with the Nobel laureate and have a conversation. That is a gift. So we have a science breakfast, which is the opportunity for us to host a discussion around a very meaningful area of research of healthy aging. So we have Liz Blackburn, who won a Nobel Prize in this field and we put her together with a group of young scientists in a forum facilitated by ourselves. Let's think about the huge amount of years that human lives are, right? So I made a little scale bar for you on this high-tech thing here. This is a time scale. What's the li maximum lifespan of a, a worm? It goes from here to here, right? Of a fruit fly, from here to here. Now things get a bit better. Okay, let's go all the way out to a mouse. All right, <laughs> keep going, keep going. OK, we've got up to kindergarten, we've got decades and decades of life. So the science breakfasts are always great fun, highly interactive, and a really good way to have meaningful debate in an area of public interest, but also interest to ourselves. We're in middle age here, so maybe somebody's getting some diabetes now. I mean, that's the thing, it's not just your lifespan, there's perhaps years of living with chronic disease. I think you get the point, yeah. right? I'm just constantly struck by how we have to be thinking in terms of enormous timescales that these things are. The world is going to be facing an aging population. We're all going to get older and there's going to be a lot more of us who are old. How do we deal with that? Helping young scientists realize that they can work with somebody and realize that these are problems that the world has to solve. And business and science can do it together. I think the private sector can play a real role because the sort of research that can be done by a company that isn't necessarily related to just the uh, quarterly bottom line is the kind of research that's complementary to what governments can fund. And I think Mars is a good example of that. So we got. 37 Nobel laureates here and just over 600 young scientists and if we can play our role in catalyzing some of the magic happening between those two groups of people then we go away very happy. <laughs>